direct from the Football Association with expert guidance, tips, insights and more for the grassroots football community with Tom Lee and Charlotte Richardson. This, this is In The Box. Hello everybody and welcome to In The Box. In The Box, as you know, is the grassroots football podcast brought to you by the Football Association. We bring you the insight, the knowledge and all the top tips as well as inside scoops from across the game that helps make grassroots football the best place to play and enjoy the beautiful game. I'm Tom Lee and I'm National Club Services Manager at the Football Association and I'm of course joined once again by the wonderful Charlotte Richardson. Hi Tom and hello everyone. Welcome if you are new to this podcast. It's great to have your company. You can catch back on previous episodes as well as a whole host of other amazing content to do with the grassroots football game. Just head to YouTube over to the YouTube hub. That's where you can find even even more or of course just go to your favourite podcast provider. Of course, we want to say a huge thank you to all those of you that do subscribe. If it is your first time listening to us, do go hit that subscribe button to make sure you keep up to date each time we release and publish an episode. And it's not just the podcast. We do host In The Box Extra Time, which is a series of webinars providing expertise from those with so much experience in grassroots football, again, on a whole host of topics. So if you're looking to upskill or maybe just improve your knowledge in a certain area, of the beautiful game then do check out those webinars as well they're really worthwhile great tip charlotte of course this is episode four there's a lot going on in the world of football right now there always seems to be but for us we really want to focus in on that grassroots football strategy which the fa has just released and talking about how it impacts you and your game let's get started let's welcome our first guest it's now time to kick off this is in the box He's Director of Football for the Football Association, and I'm really pleased that we are joined by James Kendall today to talk about the FA's really exciting new strategy for 2020 to 2024. James, a massive, massive welcome. Thank you for giving up your time to have a chat with us. First things first, can you tell us a little bit about your role and what it entails? Yes, well, thank you, Charlotte. Let me first of all thank you for uh, inviting me on to uh, this fledgling uh, podcast series. I've watched the first three. Uh, and it's great to be invited to be part of your, your fourth one. Um, yes, uh, the role I have uh, is a fantastic role. Um, essentially, it's about the way in which the FA support and invest in the grassroots game. That's the responsibility uh, that, that I have. Um, it's multifaceted in that it involves all elements of the grassroots game, whether it's the player pathways, our support to clubs and facilities and the workforce, our investment into digital and in, and, and in making sure that the environment in which the game is played is as safe and inclusive and enjoyable uh, as possible. I also have a fantastic team that Tom's a part of um, at the at the FA within the grassroots division. That's uh, that's our team, uh, and I also work with that team uh, across the, the whole of the FA to make sure the grassroots game is represented and supported as best it can, as well as with our our governance structures, whether that's with the board. Um, with the National Game Board uh, or, or the various committees that support uh, that support us and are involved in making uh, decisions around the game. And of course, we also have a whole range of tremendous partners uh, that we work with who provide funding and, and help us sort of deliver, deliver the grassroots game. So it's wide and varied. Uh, it's a great responsibility and it's a, it's, a, it's a role I love. Thanks, James. Just a little taste of, obviously, what's entailed as you say um there's a lot and there's a big passionate team that sits within it so obviously welcome to the podcast thanks for touching on the strategy for us today that we're going to talk about it's titled survive revive and thrive which feels obviously very fitting right now we've gone through a traumatic time it's been very challenging there's still probably some hurdles to get over how do you think or feel the grassroots landscape uh, is looking right now yeah thanks tom I, I think it's a really it's a really good question to ask um i think the game has been and the grassroots game and all those involved in it has been incredibly resilient and pragmatic during this incredibly difficult sort of 13 months um i think that the reality is i don't think we yet know uh the full impact of uh, of the pandemic i think we, we we need more time to see how things play out whether participants 
return in their numbers, whether volunteers do, how how the sort of the whole club network actually feel and fair. I think overall we're feeling positive. Um, that's the feedback that we're getting from people. But I think we need to take a longer term view. And that's why all these areas are very much embedded within our strategy to make sure that we have got our eyes wide open uh, to, to the situation going forward. And, and also why over the last 13 months, we tried to provide financial support uh, where we can. And obviously with the work you guys are doing and others in terms of providing business support um, to, to the clubs as well. So uh, we need to let this whole uh, sort of lockdown ease. We need to emerge out of it. And then I think we'll have a better idea of, of where, where we're going to be ending up. But I, I feel hopeful and I feel positive. Well, that's really good to hear, James, and I'm sure a lot of the grassroots football community echo those thoughts as well. And this strategy is an exciting one. But for those that haven't read it, could you perhaps summarise why a four year strategy like this is, is so important and maybe some points that are included in it that grassroots volunteers, players, coaches, those that, that listen to this podcast um, can be excited for? Yes, um, thanks, Char. I mean, I think it's so important for any organisation to have a really clear strategy. And you need a clear strategy because it provides you with direction, it provides you with purpose for all those who are working, you know, directly with the FA and, and, and beyond it. I think that's, that, that's a, a given. It's worth noting that the FA also has a four-year strategy that covers the elite game all the way through to the grassroots game. And actually within that strategy this time around, grassroots it features very, very prominently, whether that's around uh, equal access for girls, whether it's around facilities, um, our role in discrimination, what, we, what we're trying to invest in around digital. So, so the strategy we have for grassroots is, is kind of embracing that and it's building on it as well. Essentially, the grassroots strategy is about harnessing the power and the scale of football to impact communities, but also to impact the physical and mental health of individuals up and down uh, the country. The game is huge. I mean, you, you guys and your, your sort of listeners will, will understand that over 14 million people play this game um, over, over the course of a, of a year. Our recent social return investment study shows very clearly that the game contributes over 10 billion to society, and that's in terms of health and social and economic benefits each year. So we have a real responsibility as a game, both to support football but also to know the power of football in supporting society. Specifically within the strategy, it's got seven pillars, and uh, I won't take up too much of your time, but if I just give you the headlines around those, at its heart are the players, um, both in terms of, of male and, and female players. For, 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 for women, we really see that, 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 that the need there is around opportunity to play. Uh, for girls, it's around equal access in clubs uh, and in and in schools, and that's where we're focusing. For for the, for male, the male game for 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 men and for boys, it's slightly different. But it's more about uh, a flexible, more modernised offer that we need to be able to provide from four and five year olds all the way through to those who are playing walk, walking walking football. And then, very importantly, it's the infrastructure that supports those players. So, um, absolutely front and centre in there are clubs. Um, you know, we want to help clubs be sustainable. We want to help clubs to, to offer as much as possible in terms of their, their offering to, to players and be representative of their communities uh, and to make football an enjoyable experience for those that are playing. Facilities is so fundamental to what we're about. Um, you know, that crushing disappointment on a Saturday morning where your game is postponed because the pitch is waterlogged. We need to get over that. So we're we're committing to improving the quality of 5,000 pitches um, over the course of this four-year period with a real focus on grass um, up and down the country. We can't forget the volunteer workforce that are so fundamental to supporting our clubs and supporting the, the game. And we're very much focused there in, in ensuring that uh, volunteers are retained in the game, attracted to the game and feel part of a, of a community. And then there's a couple of areas that we've called our enablers, which are which is the digital infrastructure we need to put in place to make administration and playing more enjoyable and easier. And also that we create the right environment for people to play in, which is all around inclusivity and diversity, safeguarding and, and making it a respectful environment for the game to be played. And all of that is supported by our counties. We have 50 counties up and down the country 
uh, that your listeners will, will know and no doubt be working directly with. That, that, that partnership between the FA and the counties is so fundamental uh, to, to what we're about and, and it's working with them to be able to deliver what we believe is an ambitious but achievable strategy. Well, James, a really comprehensive answer. I'm sure our listeners and ourselves agree. You can really hear the passion that comes through. You truly do know and understand the strategy. You spoke there about, obviously, the club network being front and centre of it. Obviously, it's a big passion of mine. It's the area that I work in. Charlotte's all support, also supporting as a club consultant. Our clubs are getting bigger. That infrastructure is getting bigger. And it's that impact on the community that you spoke about improving the physical and mental health of the, of the nation. Obviously, people that haven't potentially read the strategy and football can be quite opinionated might think this is missing. I can't really see where that is. It's, I think what would be the underlying message? And I hear you speak very well about it, James, about leading and serving the game. Can you just position how the FA can look to lead and serve the game through this strategy moving forward and how it's a collaboration with everybody that's involved? Yeah, thank you. Uh, absolutely, Tom. I, I think serving and leading are, are the two sort of fundamental principles that underlie all of this. I think serving is, is as much a mindset as, as anything else uh, in terms of putting, um, we talk, you know, the customer is a fairly crude term, but what I mean by that is those that are volunteering, those that are playing the game, those that are involved in, on the ground uh, in the game, those, those are the people. That, uh, and the, the infrastructure and the environment that we want to we want to serve, I think, is what should be expected of a national governing body, and it's putting their interests first above above our own. Albeit, we also need to lead, which I think is something that, uh, again, national governing bodies should be doing in providing direction based on insight, based on on consultation, based on based on what we are hearing, to ensure the game is is, is going the direction that it should do. So. Serving and leading kind of underpin the culture uh, that we, we certainly have and are trying to develop within our grassroots team uh, and, and uh, in relation and, and in our partnership uh, with, with, with the counties. Serving and leading, that's really eye-opening there, just to understand a little bit about how the, the strategies come together and the values that underpin it. And, and James, I just wonder, what's the reaction been like so far to the strategy? Have you, have you had much feedback from the grassroots football community? Uh, largely positive, I think, Charlotte. Um, I mean, we, we will we'll wait to see as we come out of lockdown, we can talk to more more people. But um, largely positive. We actually launched the strategy at the same time as we, we uh, the game returned um, post um, uh, post lockdown. Um, so, uh, you know, those two things together were a really good news story. And actually, we got a, a lot of media coverage um, across print and social media and indeed um, uh, through broadcast as well. So we were really pleased with that. Um, we're hearing that the strategy makes sense to people, which is always a good start. Um, it is ambitious uh, and, and we do recognise that. But, but as I said before, I think we, we absolutely believe it's achievable and you've got to have ambition. Um, and you've got to have vision, I think, in order to be able to, to achieve the great things that we can do for the game. And you said it there as well, James, obviously about leading the FA, being brave to lead and being courageous. And that's what I hopefully will see during this strategy and that connected and collaborative approach. And I think podcasts like this podcast and other opportunities and across our county FA network, we're actually putting ourselves out there into the landscape and showing that we are visible and that we are active and that we are accessible. So it's a really exciting time to be part of this strategy once we do come out of lockdown. And I can see the people that I've spoke to that have engaged and read the strategy really are positive about it. So it's extremely exciting. What are the key things that we must stick to, James, to ensure that we're committed to delivering what's within the strategy as well as being agile enough to react to anything that might happen like another COVID variant or a, a, a significant impact that we just can't even prepare for? Well, I, I think you said it. I think agility and flexibility is, is absolutely key. But two things really stand out to me. The first is that we need to stay focused on the priorities that are laid out in the strategy. Um, what is, and I, I haven't mentioned before, but uh, needs to be said is that underpinning this is a lot of research, a lot of insight, a lot of conversations. I'm really confident that we're focused on the right areas. So I think first up, we need to stay focused on those priorities, albeit 
to your point, remain agile as we need to. And I think the other thing is to recognize that we've all got a role to play here. Um, we as the FA have a national role to play. Counties have a kind of a, a more local, uh, regional role to play. And, and clubs have an even more uh, local, community-centric role to play as well. So everyone has, has a role to, 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 to play here. And that's, I think, what's tremendously exciting is harnessing all of our passion, all of our will, all of our skill uh, to, to point it in, in one direction, which we believe the strategy can provide for us. Yeah, like you say, James, it is ultimately just a massive team effort across the whole football community. And it's been a real privilege to have you on in the box. Thank you so much for, for giving up some of your time to speak to us. And I think one of the things I've certainly taken away from this interview is just that level of excitement and a really bold vision for the future, but one that everyone can come on board with. And just before we, we wrap up, I just wondered, is there anything else that you would like to, to say or while we have this opportunity for so many people across the grassroots community tuned in, any final messages to them? Yes, I'd love to give a couple of messages. Um, I think the first, the first one is just that uh, the grassroots community know that, that we are really committed, um, and, and in terms of supporting them, particularly, the, you know, as I mentioned, the way which we want to support clubs and the way that we want to, to, to support volunteers, we're really intentional about that. We all know that the money is a limiting factor. Um, that that is the reality of life, not not least in this pandemic. But actually, when you then harness the skill that's out there, the passion that's out there, the ideas that are out there, you know, collectively, as we just said, we can make a tremendous difference together. And I think that the, the final thing that I should definitely finish on is just an enormous thank you. Um, you know, those who are involved in, in the grassroots game um, give, you know, their, their heart and their soul to, to ensuring that, that football is played in, the, in their communities. Volunteers and officials really are the lifeblood of the game. Uh, and we do recognise that and we're enormously grateful for all the time and effort that they put into uh, supporting football, particularly in this incredibly difficult period and absorbing our guidance and, and, and uh, translating that um, into their worlds of clubs, so uh, within their clubs. So, yeah, just a heartfelt thank you uh, and, uh, and to know that we're committed uh, in, and doing all that we can to support them going forward. Wonderful messages there, James. Thanks ever so much for joining us. Obviously, we look forward to a summer activity and fingers crossed we hit the ground running with a successful and a whole season from September. Absolutely. If you're ready to be built to last, this is the podcast for you. Everyone has the right to play football in a safe, fun and enjoyable environment. Protecting the welfare of children and young people in particular is the responsibility of everyone involved in the game. The FA's new Safeguarding Children course has been developed to provide the latest information and advice on safeguarding through an interactive and engaging online experience that includes videos and quizzes to assess your understanding. You can complete at your own pace with the chance to revisit modules at any point to refresh your understanding. At only £30 and with free recertification after two years, this course helps keep football safe, fun and enjoyable for everyone. Visit the Safeguarding section of the Boot Room website to find out more now. Welcome back to In The Box. We've just heard there from James Kendall himself. So essentially the top of the FA. And now who we're welcoming onto the podcast is one of the biggest voices in grassroots football. And it's from Grassroots Football UK. Please welcome to the podcast, Paul Curtin. Welcome, Paul. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Sean, for having us. Um, really interested to hear what you guys have got to say about the strategy there. Listen to what James had to say. Um, really excited to discuss it in a little bit more detail. and get the thoughts of uh, the grassroots community guys there. Yeah, Paul, thank you so much for coming on. This is a really interesting episode because we're talking all about strategy. We're talking all about the vision for the future. But first things first, for listeners who who might not know of you, you've been the MD now of grassroots football um, for seven years, I believe. That's a very, very long time. And can you tell us a little bit about your role and why the organisation exists? Yeah, I mean, the organisation was set up just to give a voice to the 14 million people that, you know, are involved, play football each week on a recreational basis. The one and a half million volunteers who are in our game, who we consider to be the real champions, the real 
unsung heroes, etc., of the game. And we set the organization up really just to, to be a voice for that community. And we've really rose through the um, the stratosphere over the last few years um, to become a real champion of that community um, and the voice, the voice of that community, which in fairness, we take really um, seriously, that responsibility. And that truly does show, Paul, the, the amount of following and the amount of engagement you have across your platforms over the seven years is a real testament to you and the organisation. Why we wanted to get you on this podcast today, just to see how the strategies landed out there with that community and you being a representation of that voice. Obviously, Paul, we've all been craving getting back to football and thankfully quite a lot of us are back there now. We use it to support positive physical and mental health. And now football has returned. How is the grassroots football community doing from your perspective? What have you seen? Is there still any major concerns? I think there's always going to be concerns, Tom, but I think ultimately the, the one fantastic thing that we can all celebrate from the very top to the you know a, a two-year-old kicking the ball for the first time is that football is back. And what I always say about football, it's not just about the team because grassroots football transcends the team. It incorporates the grandparents, it incorporates the parents, it incorporates all of that um, sphere of families, etc. Because really what we have missed over the, the last 12 months is that and it's, it, we've missed playing, we've missed exercise, we've missed coaching. And I, I don't know about you guys, but pers- on a personal level, I feel boosted um, physically, mentally by the return of grassroots football. And everything that I see getting fed into us is that the, the, the mental well-being of people has took a huge lift because football's back. It, what has also helped the sun's back. Um, and th- those two going hand in hand, it's just been overwhelming um, positive for the grassroots community because it's, and I, I've said this so many times, if you're a, a mom or a, a dad or a parent and you've got a child who's playing grassroots football, what tends to happen is the person that you stand next to each week watching that game, you know, you'll have a laugh and you'll have a, a great experience with those and they become your family. And, you know, when you if you've got a 12-year-old child, I'm sure you'll know, the first people who's on the birthday list for the invite would be your teammates. That's how strong our community is. And unless you're, in it, unless you're within our community, it's very difficult to explain that. It's kind of a lifestyle rather than a sport. And it transcends the team. And it, it just influences every part of your life, you know. So I just think it's, personally, I think it's fantastic that it's back. Um, I run a team. Um, I'm involved, obviously, as you know. Great for me. Great to see the players. Great to see the families. And just great to see smiles again because i think that's what's been missing smiles and something to look forward to etc so it's i think it's just brilliant um i can't express that passion enough i could talk here all day but it's just brilliant it's a huge leap huge leap for the sport and a huge leap for society oh paul yeah it's infectious it's and i think we all have just been so happy that that sport has returned and as you made so many really good points there but football does transcend from the pitch to the community. And we were speaking to James from the Football Association earlier. And as Tom pointed out, the lead behind this at the organisation and his vision was equally oozing with enthusiasm, positivity for the future. And I just wanted to get your thoughts initially about the strategy and what your initial feedback to it has been. What is the grassroots football community saying to the FA's strategy? Well, I mean, the, the first thing that I'll start with is by saying that I think initially I thought the timing of the strategy was quite poor. But then when I actually thought about it, when would be the best time ever? Well, actually, a restart, uh, a revival right now. I mean, we're, we're calling it the restart and rebuild. I think um, the FA is using refi- revive, thrive, etc. So actually, when you when you really delve into it, right now is probably the best time to look at a, a longer term strategy because never since the Second World War, has football stopped or have we had a time like we've just had? So first, firstly, great timing. So that's the first thing I will say. Um, the the grassroots community, as always, every single survey or every single interaction that we've had with the grassroots community over the last seven years is always facilities is the biggest issue. So what I noticed was on the, the four-year strategy, top of the agenda was 5,000 new pitches. Um, so those are the facilities that the grassroots community are are desperate for, the, the craving for, the yearn for. Um, it's a big ask. Um, I really, really hope that we can support you guys deliver that because that is what we need. And I think 
We don't always need to plow lots of money into 3G facilities. Lots of people like grass. Uh, grass is, on a personal level, I prefer grass. And I think uh, grass is more affordable. I think um, the only thing I would say is when it, when it comes to how those pitches are going to be allocated, identified, etc., collaboration with the grassroots community would be absolutely key because if we could utilise asset transfers via county FAs, national FA and the local authorities, that would certainly be something that would be the most sustainable way of doing it. Because I think if if we look at only identifying certain areas or certain clubs, etc., that might not be as sustainable as somebody putting in for asset transfer. So those 5,000 pitches, those that, those new facilities, if we could look at a large proportion of that being on an asset transfer basis, it gives the clubs a platform to build on so that they'll want us to rebuild, they'll want to sustain, and they'll want to still be here in 10 years, 30 years, 50 years, and lay foundations down for their community because ultimately that's what a club wants to do. It wants to be embedded within its community and it wants to be the heartbeat of the community as well, you know. But the the the, the general the, the general response that I've had is very, very good, big, you know, very, very big headline figures. Um, and if we can support, meet those figures, then we'll do everything in our power to do that. But the facilities, I'm glad that you have put that at the top of the agenda because forever and a day, that's always been the... the the, the, the downfall, I say, of grassroots football, the facilities that we have. Yeah, that's spot on, Paul. And I think you, you mentioned it there about everyone working together and collaborating. And it's part of the work that myself and the team of club consultants, which Charlotte's a part of, are doing is that trying to give the ownership to the clubs and the people that actually can go and run them facilities. But it's 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 no mean feat. It's a big ask. And being in a position to take on a facility is something that we really want to be able to do and establish. So where can we yourself, Paul, and other people within the community and knowing how we can cascade that knowledge and that expertise and how to take on an asset transfer and work with the local authority and the county FA is something I think we can all pro approach together and make sure we're really transparent so people can get from point A to point B as quick as they possibly can without having to navigate through any misconceptions or any misunderstandings. So it's great that you've identified that as well because ideally we all need pitches to play on and I'm the same as you, Paul. I love a grass pitch. 3Gs, I think, serve a real good purpose, but for midweek training, etc. But grass is where it's at for me. I think in terms of the knowledge sharing, the gardens, the digital tools and stuff, obviously we've got this podcast now. Is there anything else out there you feel the grassroots community could really do with or use or need for us to be able to get that information like that example there out to the community i think the lots of the grassroots community they don't always want um a free handout i just think they need a hand up sometimes and i think that that's where when the grassroots community look for that because they're very very resourceful even with poor facilities they'll do the best with them but i, I always think the ones where they've been asset transferred and they've got ownership of it they want to build on it and I think that if we can make that as easy as that journey, it's a very difficult journey. It's got litigation. It's got lots of different um, aspects in there. But this is a volunteer. And I think we always need to remember that the person who's actually going along that journey could be a teacher, could be a police officer, could work in ASDA, could be doing so many other things, nine or five or night shifts, etc. could be like pulling on their time when they come into the world of football, they're coming into it on a volunteer basis. So we need to have easy access to applications or how-to guides. So, for example, how to do an um, asset transfer, how to um, fill in an application form for funding, because these are daunting things to somebody who's never done it before. These are daunting things to somebody who has done it before. So if you're, you know, if you're, I don't know, your expert field is being know, a doctor, and then all of a sudden you've got a legal document trying to do an asset transfer for seven acres of land with um, different like legal aspects for what you can build on, what you can't build on, what sport and facilities can be there, what can't. They just need to um, have a little bit of help. And I don't think, you know, I always go back to the grassroots community, don't ever want um, a hand out. They just want a hand up. And if you give people a hand up, what you'll find is they'll start doing it upon themselves and helping everybody else up. But I think that how-to guides would be great. 
especially for these sustainable things like uh, asset transfers for like significant funding applications because everybody that we speak to and that's why we launched the grassroots fund we wanted to have a grassroots fund that was easy to apply for very swift and we took a, we took away the the, the, bo the, the bo sorry the laborious process of the application and just had a quick what do you want why do you want it that's it um and we were we were oversubscribed and i know that lots of the football foundation uh, applications are undersubscribed because people are put off by the actual application itself so a how-to guide for things like that the most regular things that come across all of the time that would be significantly helpful and easy access to it um let's put it out there in the grassroots community so people can access it very very easily you know really really great answer there and i love the idea as well about a hand up and i think that's exactly what we've been trying to do with in the box not just the podcast but with the webinars as well like sitting down and talking to people that have been there done that can break down those really intimidating processes or or parts that are new to a grassroots football volunteer so i think that's lots to take away and think about there and talking about all of the different types of stakeholders who are involved in grassroots football from those involved like Tom within the FA, myself as an FA club consultant, you and the organisation and the work that you're doing. As clubs and leagues, how can we better communicate and share and collaborate from this strategy moving forwards? I think transparency is probably the easiest thing because lots of clubs and leagues will wonder who's being um, collaborated with. So, for example, if there's a four-year strategy and there's significant allocation you know, uh, pots of money allocated for it. <laughs> Be transparent. Who's being, you know, who is it you're asking? Because can we, you know, can we get a council of leagues and clubs who we can ask so that it's very transparent that when money's spent, we can say actually we consulted X amount of leagues, X amount of clubs. Because I think sometimes the grassroots community feel as if they're not consulted on grassroots events or grassroots um, strategies. And I think they probably, in fairness, in their defence, would be correct with that i think um it just needs to be transparent this is what we're thinking because of the information that users give us you know um because without that trans transparency it, it creates a disconnect because the, the grassroots community will look and think well why haven't we been why haven't we been um, informed or why haven't we been consulted <laughs> with that decision yeah i think you're absolutely right paul and I'm, I'm i'm quite proud after being three years into the fa now and Considering everything we went through with with the pandemic, and obviously we we had redundancies and budget cuts, and to launch this strategy, and things like this, these conversations, and bring them to the floor, I'm hoping and I'm, I'm I can see it happening that there's going to be more transparency moving forward. Them ideas around you said we did, and evidence and everything that we've actually delivered within the game, because obviously there is difficulties within any strategy. There's going to be things that people feel might be missed. There's going to be pots of money that's going to be available, but it only goes so far. So that hand up is ever so important, Paul, for us to be able to actually bring on board those those people that are in a position, able, willing, and wanting to collaborate and move forward. An example being like the, the FA Charter Standard Accreditation, that framework is going to evolve this summer. And that's because the grassroots football community outgrew the framework. They saw it, they stretched it, they took it beyond what it is. So like you say, Paul, once you give somebody a little bit of opportunity, they've got the passion and the commitment to take it to that next level. What I was going to say was the grassroots community are very, very good at taking this, this amount and turn it into that amount. Um, they're, they're so resourceful because if you give the grassroots community a pitch, they'll build uh, a home, they'll build uh, a clubhouse, they'll build, you know, they'll build a community and they'll put their life, their soul and their heart all on the line to make it theirs. If you don't, in the use and council facilities, it's always reliance upon somebody else, the expense on somebody else. If you bring that in-house, that'll just grow. And I think you're right what you're saying about the, the charter standard was the best uh, forward step towards building that home. Um, I've, I've noted and I've obviously worked with you, Tom, on the new accreditation scheme that's coming in. I think that'll, just, that'll take that into second gear. And I think there's lots of gears we can take that through. As long as we give the ownership back into the, the owner, the, sorry, the ownership of the um, the future into the grassroots clubs and into the grassroots leagues, because ultimately, sometimes lots of people from the grassroots community actually do have the answers. 
um, actually do have great ideas and have great drive and energy and passion to, to drive that forward. And I think accepting that and having that transparent culture is only going to help everybody. It'll grow the game because the bigger the club gets, the more they're going to um, bring in the community. And I think that's just a great thing. And I, but the days of seeing pitches being sold off and youth clubs getting closed, that's, that's difficult because grassroots communities utilise those youth clubs, utilise those pitches. So they're the last bastion, the last heart people in those communities who really want to um, to drive it forward. So putting them at the heart of it, I think, is the best thing we can possibly do. Well, thanks, Paul. And I think for anyone wanting to learn a little bit more about the FA accreditation, we, we did a whole episode of In The Box on that subject. And again, it just builds this picture of such an optimistic, energising future. We've all missed football so much. And I do think if there's one small positive to glean, I don't think we're ever, ever going to take it um, for granted ever again. Paul, thank you so much for, for coming and being a part of this episode of In The Box. And I'm really looking forward to seeing what you do, what Grassroots Football UK does over an exciting summer as we ease out of lockdown and get back playing in, in our normal way of life. Thanks, Charlotte. Thanks very much, Tom, for having us on today. This, this is In The Box. Well, that's it for another episode of In The Box. Thanks again for listening. Do make sure you go and subscribe so you get that awesome little ping each time we release an episode. And don't forget to leave your comments as well because those comments really do help spread the word about this podcast and also help us tailor our content. We are the number one grassroots football podcast out there. We're here to help and support the grassroots football community. So if there is anything we can help you on, just let us know. And not only that, but do please help spread the word about the podcast as well, whether it's to your colleagues, your fellow volunteers. If you found us useful, they might well do as well. So you've read it there. Like, comment, and please go and share. Of course, look to engage with me and Charlotte. We're both active on social media. You can find us both on Twitter. But for now, it's a full-time whistle. Take care and see you next time. See you very soon.